It's hard to say which way is up and which way is down. How am I to know what to follow? But that seems so simple. The most important truths often are. But you must learn to discern them for yourself. I won't always be here to speak them to you. Rings of Power is a billion dollar gamble from Jeff Bezos to dethrone the Game of Thrones prequel House of Dragon as the new biggest show on TV. But as they say, no matter the money you enter with, the house always wins. At least, that seems to be the general consensus out there that I've heard, and having now watched both pilot episodes for this video, I do agree that Dragon has a much better launch into the narrative than Rings. Now, that doesn't mean Rings doesn't shine in other areas. The music in that show is out of this world, the billion dollar production value is definitely visible on screen, the scope of the project overall seems much bigger, and you could argue that the IP itself is much more inherently valuable than its competitors. And who knows, maybe by the second episode this actually becomes the best show ever. I don't know. But strictly in terms of the pilot episodes that I've seen, Dragon does do a much better job at introducing and pulling the audience into this world, especially with general audiences like me that won't be won over with the fantasy elements alone. Like, don't get me wrong, I think the second half of the movie trilogy is incredible. I think the season with Pedro Pascal is incredible, one of the most memorable episodes of TV I've ever seen. Elia Martel, who gave you the order? Who gave you the order? Who gave you the order? But that said, this isn't pirates, there's no Captain Jack, so, you know, let's just keep things in perspective. With most audiences, your pilot episode will have to win them over as an episode of TV rather than as a collection of the fantasy elements you paid for. See, both shows have a lot of the same fantasy stuff. They have dragons, they have fairy tale geography, they have immigrant heroes who left their homeland after something bad happened, they have terrible evils looming in the horizon. Gusting out of the distant north. Sauron was here. And yet in Dragon, all that stuff is much easier to get into in terms of story and the scenes and the characters. If I'm gonna watch more, this is what I'll watch first. So today, let's compare these fantasy pilot episodes to see how to build your show on its quality as a show rather than on its fantasy elements. And again, just the pilot episodes, because there's no way I'm covering full seasons in one video, and because the pilot episode is your calling card for the viewer and therefore the most important. Here is why House of Dragon has a much better launch into the fantasy series than Rings of Power and what to learn from it. This is Dorothea? Yes, dear. The reason the story in Dragon Reigns Supreme is because it's presented as a human story that everyone can understand and emotionally invest in, whether they care about fantasy or not. Essentially, the gist is that the land is ruled by this Targaryen king who sits on a somewhat contested throne because he wasn't the original heir, which is why he's now obsessed with getting a son to secure his lineage. An obsession that isn't nice for his daughter, who feels left out because her father barely even acknowledges her for her for the first hour of the episode. My son will be born. The whole realm will celebrate. But when the king's wife and newborn son die, that tips the crown even more off balance, which is why finally the king really talks with his daughter for the first time in the show to make her his heir. And that is the human core that the show will be about, this young woman's climb toward the highly contested throne as she at the same time tries to make herself seen. This is no trivial gesture, remember? The Iron Throne is the most dangerous seat in the world. Rings, you can find a similar human core that is arguably as emotionally strong. We have this elf commander Galadriel who's obsessed with finding Sauron because he killed her brother. My brother gave his life hunting Sauron. His task is now mine. The issue, however, is the fact that our way into the story isn't built on this human core, but rather on all the fantasy context, which the pilot dumps on us in a never-ending exposition opening. Basically, the elves lived happily in Elfland until this evil cloud showed up to kill their tree. And so the elves then sailed into Middle Earth to defeat the cloud's orc army, which they did. The cloud was defeated and all the orcs moved under the command of Sauron, who in the process also killed Galadriel's brother. But then Sauron and his orc army suddenly went missing, and so now Galadriel's trying to find this evil that all others believe doesn't exist anymore for some reason. And there you go, now we're like 20 minutes in. And, 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 and. And while this fantasy stuff might be really cool to fans who already understand it, to more general audiences it's more like, 
you know, as a wise man once said. The great foe, Morgoth, destroyed the very light of our home. We left Valinor and no journeyed. Offense, no offense, but it sounds like some <laughs> commie gobbledygook. <sighs> You got me, Norm. I mean, I've never heard the word joking aside, though, these fantasy elements are important because that's what makes this IP what it is. And again, you'll find most of the same stuff in Dragon as well. The idea that we control the dragons is an illusion. On the broad Valeria, it's doomed. Princess Nymeria led her Voinar across the narrow sea on 10,000 ships to flee their Valyrian pursuers. Just to begin the terrible winter. Gusting out of the but the difference is that in Dragon, at this point, it's left in the background so that the entry in the story can instead happen through the human side that all human viewers can get into. And so, if your show's core is about Galadriel's vengeance, maybe make the pilot about that. That Galadriel wants very much to be with her brother because he's her only family, but he keeps being pulled away by his mission to find Sauron. And when she finally thinks he's gonna come back for good, turns out that mission claimed his life, which is why she now vows to finish her brother's mission at any cost herself, so that their relationship wasn't sacrificed for nothing. You know, is there just mentioning in the opening exposition dump that, oh yeah, by the way, her brother died. But Sauron found him first and marked his flesh with a symbol. One whose meaning even our wisest could not discern. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the because if you're not taking the audience on a human journey, a lot of audiences won't go at all. We have this other storyline with these immigrant Frodo people and there's no indication of what the overall purpose of it will be. We have this third storyline with this soldier elf who does find evil force at play. She wandered east a few days ago. How far east? but again without any sense of why that journey is important to him as a person. And so the point is that no matter your fantasy elements, your pilot episode has to be built on the human core that the show will be about. When the daughter at the end gets made into an heir in front of the king, it's very clear what the show will be. When Dolores at the end breaks her loop, very clear what the show will be. When Elizabeth at the end stands by the sick king's empty desk, very clear what the show will be. But when leaves at the end fall from a tree and a naked dude falls from the sky, not so much. Not only do I not know what any of this means, it also carries no meaning to me whatsoever. And so then, what is my emotional motivation to get invested? In other words, the audience doesn't need to know how they got somewhere as early as they need to know what they're doing there and why. It was enough for me to just open the video by talking about the point of the video. I didn't need to explain the whole backstory that led up to it. That, oh, I bought these new pants and realized that my wallet was too big to fit in them. And so this heavenly force then said that if I talk about Rings of Power, they'll send me a better wallet for free. Which they did. They sent me these minimalist wallets which fit my pants no problem. It is good for you to know that now, because these rich wallets are great. They're tiny in size, yet hold up to 12 cards plus cash that you can slide out like a boss. They come in many cool colors and designs, as well as premium materials, from carbon fiber to aluminum to burnt titanium. But the point is that it wasn't necessary for you to know that in the beginning for the video to work. At this point though, definitely, they're sponsoring a 10% discount and free international shipping with code Fomento, so up your wallet game with the link below. The reason the scenes in Dragon Reign Supreme is because they're always built on conflict that is personally motivated. We have a daughter who wants to be seen by her father. You haven't spoken a word to me since mother's funeral. And now you answer me. Which doesn't fit the father, the king, who has to worry about his crown. We have a husband of another crown candidate who wants to solve problems in his area. If those shipping lanes should fall, it will be. The crown has heard your Which doesn't fit others in the council who seek to be in the king's favor. We have a brother of the king who wants a seat in the front row, which doesn't fit a lot of people. He publicly mutilates a part of the city to make a name for himself. He's constantly at odds with the hand of the king because they both want what only one can have. Even the physical conflict is built on this like in the night games. The brother chooses to fight the Han's son and beats him in a not so fair way. That's right, we're gonna cheat. <laughs> After which he flirts with the Han's daughter. Good luck, my friends. After which he fights some random guy, which is still strong because it's mostly about him maintaining his stature in front of all these people, which we know is very important to him. Rich Taman Tartarian wishes to continue 
I mean, just look at all the dramatic irony built here. We know that the king killed his wife for a chance to save his son, and we know that the daughter doesn't know, which becomes a ticking bomb of when is she gonna find out. We know that the Han sends his own girl, the daughter's best friend, to console and seduce the king to secure his position. You might wear one of your mother's dresses. Which becomes a ticking bomb of oh, if it works, the daughter will lose her father again because of her best friend. <laughs> Overall, the conflict always comes from people having motivations that cannot coexist, which makes the scenes very thrilling and entertaining. Whereas in Rings, most of the conflict comes not from character versus character, but instead from hero versus the script. When Galadriel is searching for Sauron in the north, her second in command wants to turn back. Surely we must first return home to take counsel with the High King. And we don't go deeper into that, into him wanting that for some larger reason, into him somehow turning her own squad against her or finding a way to get rid of her. No, the whole squad is full of crybabies who can't keep up with Galadriel and so they all want to turn back. Which is what happens. And apparently all of these characters leave the show at the end of the pilot, so it doesn't really matter anyway. When Galadriel gets back and tells her politician friend she wants to set out again, the friend is like, no. And again, not for a larger personal reason. It's not like he wants her to stay with him. It's not like he needs to dissuade her to win favor with the elf king. If you want a place in the kingdom, then you must be useful to it and find a way to pressure Galadriel out. He just says no when she says yes, and that's it. Which is why this relationship is pretty tensionless and boring. Rather you who defied the High King by refusing to heed any limit. When the Elf King decides to send Galadriel back home, same thing. We don't go into the King's personal reasons for ousting her other than he's the King. We don't do anything with that conflict like by having Galadriel try to find a way to undo that decision. No, it's more like the script says that's what's happening now and then it happens. As another example, when the soldier elf checks on a human village they're keeping an eye on after the war, one of the villagers lets him have it. Our true king will return and pry us right out from under your pointy boot. Which doesn't happen because this guy has some apparent personal reason to hate elves, but just because, you know, the elves are hated here and he's away for the script to show that. Hey, we don't take kindly to your types in here. Now calm down, Skeeter, he ain't hurting nobody. No. Even when the conflict is handed on a silver platter, it's still fumbled. The elf has a human girlfriend, which is kind of forbidden, but then that being exposed is just treated like a joke. Did you draw some water? The girlfriend's family used to serve the evil cloud that killed armies of elves, which could be great dramatic irony to develop, but then it just immediately openly brought up and dropped. The people of Hoden were known for having been especially strong in the loyalty to Morgoth. I'm talking about my friends. That is why I'm here with you. It's the only kind touch I've known all my days. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the, the girlfriend has a son, which by default offers very strong potential conflict, which the episode uses for a short roast. Doing your mom. It's a lie. And as for the Frodo people, just forget it. This Frodette girl goes to eat berries where she comes across a wolf and nothing happens. She goes home where her parents find out she ventured off and nothing happens. It's all just kind of meaningless in a larger sense, especially compared to a young woman losing her mother and thus becoming the thing that her uncle seeks to be, compared to two brothers viewing a loss through a very differently motivated lens. My family has just been destroyed. You chose to celebrate your own rise! Point is that no matter your fantasy elements, your conflict has to come from personal motivations and not from, oh, this evil cloud attacked, oh, the evil trail leads too far north, oh, the villagers hate elves, oh, the hero is about to be sent into this bright sunlight. The reason the characters in Dragon Reign Supreme is because they feel like people behaving according to human logic rather than whatever fairy tale fantasy logic. I already talked about motivations, but the point is that it's not so much about good and evil here as it is about the human condition. Yes, the king chooses to murder his own wife, but it's because he's so desperate for an heir to stabilize his throne. Yes, the brother lashes out against everyone around, but it's because he feels that's the only way to be involved. Yes, the Han uses his own girl like merchandise, but that's what it takes to secure 
secure their position. Yes, the girl starts DMing the dad of her best friend, but she's just obeying her own dad, like what she's supposed to do. You know, regardless of whatever fantasy land these people live in, all of them behave like people that all audiences can understand. Yeah, that makes sense. Whereas in Rings, people behave more according to whatever the script says, like in the main story. Everything is set in motion when this evil cloud attacks the elves and pulls them into war, which happens without any explanation as to why. It's just an evil cloud, I guess. <laughs> The big challenge comes from the fact that nobody wants to help or even allow Galadriel to seek Sauron, because despite it just being established that his orc forces are growing ever stronger, multiplying ever greater, they're all probably gone now. And our enemy is no more. And it's like, yeah, we better not worry about the enemy because we'll just manifest it. Well, the same wind that seeks to blow out a fire may also cause its spread. Like, yes, this super smart elf metaphor can be cool, but in terms of human logic, it makes no sense. The whole concept of this massive evil just disappearing makes no sense. For his orcs had spread, multiplying ever greater, under the command of his most devoted. Is it not possible the other commanders are right, and our enemy is no more? And at the end, when Galadriel is almost in Elfland, she decides to go back to Middle-earth and jumps off the boat. Which I guess is cool thematically and visually, but also forms the question that isn't she just like in the ocean now? Is she gonna swim across it? Why couldn't she just go home, steal another boat and sail that to Middle-earth? And maybe that's on me, maybe I'm the one missing the fantasy context. Maybe the elves can't leave their homeland because these clouds are actually a force field controlled by someone that Galadriel can't get to. No. Maybe swimming across an ocean is easy for an elf, maybe. What I'm saying is that I only know what's on screen, and based on what's on screen, this action follows no human logic. And so what I'm getting at is that a lot of the characters here are treated not as people, but more as extensions of the lore and the plot. We have the high elves who are all so polite and blank that it makes them super boring to watch. We have the villager who in one scene is willing to confront an elf soldier face to face, and in the next scene runs and hides when he hears a sound. We have his friend who initially seems to be the inferior part of their relationship. Be quick about it. Maybe that's why your father run off. But then suddenly acts as if he's the one in charge. Go on quick. Oh, okay. Yeah. We have the wise Frodo people guy who we know is the wise one because he spouts fantasy exposition to himself. Almost like, like they're watching for something. And I would give more examples, but there aren't many examples to give. The elves are elves, and the humans are humans, and the Frodo people are Frodo people. Like, I have no reason to think Frodette is a bad character, but I also don't get enough to really see her, at least not outside of the usual, oh, she's a small person wanting to explore the big world. No significant enough actions and choices are being made to let me in, especially compared to the king's daughter struggling to play her part and set her dead mother's corpse on fire. They're waiting for you. Especially compared to the king's brother causing scenes because otherwise he'd be a ghost. You've only ever tried to send me away to the Vale, to the City Watch, anywhere but by your side. And again, I'm not saying this or anything else to be like, haha, rings bad, dragon good. I don't know or care. I'm just trying to convey that in your fantasy show's pilot episode, you can't rely on the fantasy doing the work for you, because to most audiences, it'll mean nothing. You have to build your show like any other. Because unless you're lucky enough to carry the biggest name seen on TV ever, chances are you'll crash and burn at the starting line.